Um, my name is Joanne Conklin. I'm the director of the David Witten Bell Gallery here at Brown and also a member of the Public Art Committee. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the celebration of Brown's 10th Percent for Art Commission, a work by renowned New York artist Spencer Finch entitled The Garden in the Brain. Spencer's garden is not one work but rather a series of nine interventions into the fabric of the building. Um, he has incorporated tessellations or tiling patterns in glass, wood, ceramic, and other finishing materials that surround us. And standing here, I can see three of the nine installations. So I'll point out to you the, the beautiful tessellations in the glass frit wall of the curtain wall. Um, also, much more subtle in its effect is the wooden floor at the back by the windows, which you can take a look at after. And we get just a, a little peek at the beautiful um, etched plywood grid that is all along the entranceway on the bottom, on the lower level. Um, as you can see, some of these things are quite dynamic and some are very subtle and that was very purposeful on Spencer's part. He hopes that people will sort of recognize them over time. And um, for your convenience, in the brochure, the brochure, the program that's on your chair, has a map on the back of it that has all the locations of the pieces throughout the building. So you can do a little self-guided tour after the lecture or at some point in the future. The Public Art Committee has worked with artists on a number of building interventions. Our first percent for art project, which was Diane Samuel's glass bridge in the Sydney E. Frank Hall for Life Science, set a standard for public art that was integrated into its surroundings rather than being set down next to the building. But Spencer's work is certainly the most extensive project to date. And part of the joy of working with a living artist is that they often conceive of works that are beyond our expectations. Um, and I'm, I'm reminded of the meeting, the end of the meeting, where Spencer first presented his proposal to us that had, I think, 12 sites around the building. And at the end of the meeting, John Cook, who was the project manager, said to me, so which ones does he want to use? And I said, I think all of them. And it was so exciting. And it was a great, it was a challenge to us to be able to deal with it. Um, and we're all delighted with the, with the finished work. Um, this project, because it is incorporated into the building, um, was logistically quite complicated. It took a huge team of people um, to coordinate and cooperate and, and um, use their skills on putting these pieces together. So I, I really want to take a moment to thank our team and I'm, I'm going to list them hopefully quickly so as not to be too long-winded, but if there's anyone here that I've forgotten, please stand up and let us know that you're here when I get done. Um, first of all, Brown's project manager, John Cook, and Jay Sisson, who is senior construction manager. The two of them oversaw every part of the production and installation. And just as this building wouldn't have gotten built without John, the artwork in it wouldn't have happened without him also. Architects from the firm of Caring Timberlake, particularly Rachel Stout, Mark Davis, and Jason Smith, opened their designs to make space for Spencer's work and advised Spencer on many um, many decisions regarding materials and placement, things that he really didn't know about but learned about through the process. And the project wouldn't have happened without the coordination team from Shama Construction, including Perry Ashenfelter, Kylie Williams, and Peter Lomadale, and the skills of a lot of tradesmen. Bill Regario and the crew of Regario Floors and Tiles, who did all of the floor and wall tiles. Massey Glass, which did the beautiful glass frit. Schumacher Landscaping did the tiling, the, pa the pavers outside. And Jason Warren and the crew at Production Plus who produced and installed the stunning wood panels. 
I also want to thank members of the engineering department who were actively engaged with the public art project um, from the selection of the artists to the placement of works and it was a great partnership. Um, lovely people, <laughs> loved working with them, um, really interested in what we were doing. So um, particularly to Dean Larry Larson, Associate Dean Rod Beresford, and Associate Dean Jennifer Casasanto. Um, and also to the engineering students who we met with several times about what this project would turn out to be. Finally, to, I want to thank um, Emily Rotolo and James Cohen of James Cohen Gallery, and Amber Heaton, who was Spencer's trusted and efficient studio assistant, who was our first line of communication to him while he was off traveling in, in other areas. And of course, our, my, my greatest thanks to Spencer. Um, the goal of the engineering department was that this building would sustain the work of the, the department for at least 100 years. And it's extremely satisfying to know that Spencer's work will be contributing to that effort for years to come. So I, I just want to say a personal thanks and a public art committee thanks to Spencer for sharing um, your talent and vision with the Brown community. And now I'm going to turn the mic over to Dean Larson, who is going to introduce Spencer. Uh, Joanne, thank you uh, so much. And Joanne, I would like to acknowledge your wonderful leadership of this process, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, the contributions of the uh, Public Art Committee. We formed a wonderful partnership with this group over the last uh, years, and the beautiful result is, is all around us today. Uh, this new building represents uh, our collective aspirations and visions of what it means to do great science and engineering in the 21st century. And we feel this is an endeavor that's open, collaborative, impactful for society, deep, and, uh, and passionate. And uh, so, you know, many of us are going to be calling this building home in the future. Uh, for our students, it'll be their home for, for years to come, for the faculty and staff for many decades to come. And so we wanted to work closely with an artist who really understood uh, our aspirations as a community and really understand the connections of the work that we do to the world around us. And as we thought about this opportunity, you know, it occurred to us that the, uh, the modern world of science is characterized by light and pattern, these two themes and their interactions with each other. You know, the pattern of the strands of the DNA molecule or the light that travels down a fiber uh, optic uh, cable uh, or the patterns of ones and zeros that flow through our digital devices. And so we were, uh, you know, both ecstatic uh, and humbled and a little bit afraid when uh, Spencer Finch agreed to work with us on this project. Uh, I think no one, uh, no artist in the contemporary world really understands this pattern of, uh, you know, the pattern and light better than Spencer. Um, his list of uh, solo exhibitions, uh, group exhibitions, commissions, and public uh, projects fills many, many pages. And his work is on permanent exhibition at, uh, at various deemed institutions uh, around the world. Uh, and I'd like to really mention just two of his most moving and affecting works. The first, uh, Trying to Remember the Color of the Sky on that September morning, is the only artwork commissioned for the National 9-11 Memorial uh, Museum in uh, Lower Manhattan. Uh, Spencer hand-painted 2,983 uh, squares of paper, one square, each square in a unique shade of blue, uh, representing uh, someone killed during the 9-11 attacks or the World Trade Center attacks in 1993. Uh, the cumulative effect of this piece, which is the first thing that visitors uh, see when they enter the museum, uh, is really unforgettable. It's both uh, uh, profoundly beautiful and, and terribly sad. Uh, Spencer joins us here today from Baltimore, where he's installing uh, his, his impressive light installation, Moon Dust Apollo 17, which will illuminate the Baltimore Museum of Art's uh, lobby for the next uh, seven years. And this is an amazing piece. It's a glowing abstract sculpture uh, composed of 417 LED light bulbs that create a precise three-dimensional scale model of the moon's atomic makeup. Uh, Spencer represents the chemical elements of moon dust with light bulbs uh, in varied sizes. And the differently sized bulbs uh, correspond to the relative atomic weights of uh, oxygen, uh, iron, and chromium, the smallest light bulbs being oxygen and the largest bulbs being iron and chromium. So you can see that Spencer really gets science, which, which we appreciate here very much. <laughs> um, I'd like to conclude uh, kind of on a personal note. Um, 
Uh, from the moment Spencer started working with us uh, on this project, we really felt that he got us here. And um, uh, he uh, had many joint meetings, as Joan mentioned, with students, with faculty, with staff. He took copious notes. Uh, he asked many, many deep questions, and he listened very carefully to our community. Uh, we loved his enthusiasm, his creativity, and his joy in this project. Um, uh, as the installation proceeded last summer and into the fall, it was great to see him here. Uh, he had on a hard hat and a safety vest. He was working with the installers and the architects, and he always had a big smile on his face. It was really wonderful. So the result, uh, the Garden in the Brain 2017, is such a deep and impressive work. Uh, it's beautiful, it's thought provoking, it's uh, cleverly placed throughout the building, and we think it has many deep puzzle patterns, which our community of puzzle solvers will spend many uh, years trying to figure out in the years ahead. So uh, Spencer, it's really been an honor uh, and pleasure uh, for us to work with you on this project. It's going to enlighten our community uh, for many decades to come. Thank you, Spencer. Thanks, Larry, for the uh, kind introduction. And um, it's uh, really nice to be here at Brown. And it's nice also that uh, Everything's done. Um, <laughs> um, I would like to thank especially two people who were um, really involved uh, through the whole process, uh, uh, Joanne Conklin and John Cook, who were on, I think, every conference call. There are a lot of people um, who, who were uh, involved throughout, but those two people were the stalwarts and the, the huge problem solvers. and. Um, and really made uh, my job easier and, uh, and made it a real pleasure to, uh, to work on this project. Um, and I'd also uh, like to uh, acknowledge the architects who are here. I think Jason and uh, Mark are both here. Rachel's not here today. But uh, I, I, in the experience I've had working with uh, with architects, uh, there, there are two types, uh, architects who are <laughs> pro-art and architects who are anti-art. And uh, the architects at Kieran Timberlake are very uh, pro-art. And it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to work with people who are supportive of what we do as artists. Uh, and also, um, Larry, who, uh, who's, uh, who I had conversations with at the very beginning of the project. And um, really, it was those conversations that were the impetus for this idea of tessellation. And we talked a lot about what uh, students, what engineering students are interested in looking at and thinking about. And we talked a lot about patterns and about how patterns have meaning in engineering and how patterns have meaning in art. And, uh, and, and that conversation is what led me into this world of tessellation, which I got into very deep and um, understand in a very sort of small way. Um, so if you have any technical questions about tessellation, you can ask Larry. If you have any aesthetic questions about tessellation, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I, I'm going to talk today about um, the, uh, well, about sort of science in my work, and, and uh, particularly the scientific method, which is something that's been important to me um, really since, since I've been working, and sort of end up with a little bit of discussion about the, um, about the project here. And I realize I left my notes on my chair, so I'm going to get them. <laughs> Um, so uh, one of the great things about, uh, that I find about being an artist is, uh, is when there are people uh, who are interested in art who aren't artists or aren't insiders. And one of the great things about this project was working with uh, engineers who are not sort of, who are not art historians and have a, an openness to art and a willingness to share um, the sort of spirit in which the work is made. And it reminded me of this piece, which I made many years ago. 
1994, and it's called Blue Wave. And it is a, a piece, I don't even remember what I was thinking about, but basically what happened was I had my brain wave recorded while looking at the blue wave from Hawaii Five-0. And, um, and then it, was, it went into the, uh, you, you can see the old Mac, and then it uh, was transferred to video, and then there was a, a transformer uh, that uh, sent it to the antenna, and then was projected, uh, shot into outer space using a microwave antenna so it would penetrate the Earth's ionosphere and go directly into outer space. And, um, and it was sent to uh, the bluest star in the night sky, which is the uh, left boot of, um, of Orion, the star Regal. And it, um, now I can't even remember, it's something like 800 light years away. So it's well on its way. And um, I, I like to say that it's, it's, it's it's kind of invisible, but it's also the biggest sculpture ever made because it's only about an inch high, but 186,000 miles long. Um, but what I was thinking of this piece was probably my favorite viewer in the whole world is this guy named Bill Olson, who designed this antenna for me. And he's, he's someone um, who, he lives in Maine, and he has two jobs. He's an antenna designer, and he's a square dance caller. And he does those, those two things. And he would come not as an antenna designer, but as a square dance caller to New York occasionally when I have exhibitions. And he um, he's not, doesn't really look at art that much, but he would come to my shows, and we would go around, and I would explain what I was doing. And he would say, that's great. And then he'd start like stamping his foot like a square dance caller if he really liked something. <laughs> and, um, and so, for me, to, to work with people like Bill or people like Larry who are in a different field um, but who share uh, a, a sympathy with the work is, is um, especially uh, gratifying. Um, as, as, uh, as the politicians say, I'm not a scientist, but, uh, but, I, am, <laughs> but I am interested in science and I'm really interested in the scientific method. And I'm interested in, I was thinking about it for this w before uh, organizing these slides. And I remember from high school physics class, you know, this sort of where you do the experiment and the points are off the line and then you sort of draw the line sort of down the middle and that's where the law is. And what I'm really interested in is the, is the space between the point and the line and that sort of gap where uh, subjectivity happens, where uh, where I think beauty happens, where, where something human happens, and where, where poetry happens. So that, that sort of, um, the part of uh, empiricism, of observation, that is, uh, that is flawed, that is human, but is still sort of determined to find some sort of truth, is, is for me what is uh, so sort of wonderful and engaging about, about, about science and the scientific method, and it's, it's part of, I guess the sort of grammar of how I make art. It's, just, it's really sort of intrinsic into, uh, in my way of working. Um, and I'm going to show a few pieces that uh, are sort of connected in some way. <laughs> this is a very strange piece um, that is called Composition in Red and Green. And it's a, um, it's a sort of homage to Isaac Newton. And what it does, it's an apple dropping mechanism that drops an apple on the floor every three minutes throughout the course of the day and creates this composition of red apples on the green, um, on the green square of AstroTurf, uh, a different composition every day. Then the apples are sort of checked at the end of the day. If they're bruised or rotten, then they go out and, if they, and then they go back up into the chute and they drop down and they form another, another composition every day. And it's, um, as, as many artworks do, this, this work had some sort of unexpected pleasures, which uh, uh, one was that it really smells like apples in the gallery whenever it's shown, because they, they bruise up a bit and they, and they emit this, this, uh, this beautiful apple smell. Um, it's, in, in this way, I, I guess in some ways it's kind of like an ex a new experiment in, in um, 
informal composition every day. And uh, the composition, you know, the apples fall differently. The apples are in different position. The apples are different shape. Um, and they create a different form e every day. And, uh, and sometimes they're sort of uh, beautiful compositions, and sometimes they're like, you know, sort of strange and not so nice compositions. This one, <laughs> this one was not actually a real composition. I think this was done for the camera. They never like, we had, <laughs> like me in physics class, you cheated a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a piece, um, and uh, I, I'm, I am very careful when I talk about this piece. Uh, usually there are no sort of scientists or engineers in the audience, but this piece deals with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And I was once giving a lecture and it was interrupted by an astrophysicist in the, in the audience who um, corrected me severely about my misunderstanding about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So I'm going to kind of assume that you all know what it is, so I don't have to explain it. But um, I became very interested in this uh, idea that Vladimir Nabokov describes in his uh, memoir, Speak Memory, where he associates a color with each letter in the alphabet. And he calls it colored hearing. It's a kind of synesthesia, I guess. It's not really synesthesia. But for each color, he has a, uh, for each letter, he has a color that he associated with it. Um, so for example, I's and E's are both yellows. Uh, B is burnt sienna, C is uh, azure with mother of pearl, T is the color of pistachio, uh, X is the color of uh, brown shoelace. So they're very kind of literary colors. Oh, the pink, the pink I remember is uh, the color of pink flannel. So I had this idea, uh, I had this sort of um, stuff, data, I guess, or no, system, I guess it was a system, this color system of, uh, of Nabokov, and I wasn't sure what to do with it. Like, what text was I going to transliterate with that? And that was really the problem. So I sort of sat with it for a year or so, and then I realized that the perfect text was, in fact, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So what I did is I transliterated uh, about 10 pages, crucial pages, of, the, uh, of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, leaving out numbers because he had no colored numbers. So it's just the, it's just the letters, and then, uh, transliterated that into Nabokov's system of color and then uh, put it on that uh, huge uh, mural of 36 sheets of paper and, uh, and created this sort of abstraction of, of that text. So, I mean, I guess if you had some sort of supercomputer, you could maybe uh, work backwards and get right back, right back to the text. But for me, um, what I, what I love about the um, uncertainty principle is um, probably something different uh, from uh, what scientists love. And that, that like, I, I like to think of it as, um, as a sort of relativity that, that exists on a, on a physical level, not on a subatomic level. So the idea that's so intrinsic to that theory that when you, uh, when you uh, look at something, you change it, and which, is, which is true on this, on this tiny, tiny level, but is not true on a sort of a physical level. It's something that I find uh, really interesting as an artist and to think about the, the, the act of viewing as, as changing what you look at, and, and that um, in the same sense that by, by viewing a particle, you change its uh, momentum or, uh, or, or direction. Um, that when, when you look at something, you, um, you put something of yourself into it and, and change it. So that's kind of what I was, I was, was thinking about with this. And it ends up being all these particles uh, buzzing around on this, on this big uh, mural-sized piece. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in uh, a time when there were people who did science and art at the same time, and there are people, I mean, there are people like, uh, like the American Samuel F. B. Morris, who was a painter, you know, a so-so painter, but then, uh, and then invented the telegraph on a, um, and actually built it on a painting stretcher. And then there, um, there are people like uh, Goethe, who of, of course was a fantastic poet, but also was a, was a great naturalist and scientist and, 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 um, 
and study the world. And this piece was sort of an homage to Goethe, and it's in um, his, his book about color, his theory of color, which is um, sort of uh, vehemently anti-Newtonian and also um, accurate, I mean inaccurate, but, uh, but also incredibly beautiful. He uh, describes a recipe for making the most beautiful shade of blue, which is, which is this. So you put a pencil uh, on a piece of paper uh, at dusk and then light a candle in front of it. And the uh, shadow that is cast, according to Goethe, is the most beautiful uh, blue that ever existed. And it is really a wonderful shade of blue. So that idea of science and art coming together somehow in this, um, in this sort of uh, awareness uh, of the kind of wonder and beauty of the world is something that was, uh, I think, much more integrated in the, uh, in the 18th and 19th century than it is now. I guess also, you know, things are so much more specialized now, it's hard, I, it would be hard to be a practicing scientist and practicing artist at the same time. But that, that spirit, that impulse is something that I find really uh, compelling. Um, this is a work that is kind of empirical in a way, um, and it's called Back to Kansas. And it's a, uh, it's a wall painting uh, that has 70 colors taken from the uh, Wizard of Oz, 70 technicolors taken from the Wizard of Oz. And it's um, a really boring artwork. I, I've made a lot of boring artworks in my time, but this might take the cake, in that it requires you to sit for about half an hour at dusk in a room that's illuminated only by daylight. And people sit there with a scorecard and uh, record uh, the time. I mean, they don't have to. They can just sort of you know, sit back and eat popcorn if they want. But uh, if you want to, you can write on the scorecard the time at which the color disappears, that you can no longer see it, and it turns to gray. And of course, each individual has this different uh, and very personal perceptual apparatus. And, um, and so the colors disappear at different times. The, um, the uh, short wavelength colors disappear first, the long wavelength colors disappear uh, later, and also, um, I mean, women who have greater sensitivity to long wavelength light, they tend to see the long wavelength color uh, uh, longer than, than men do. And so in the end, you, um, all the colors are gray for everyone, and it's, uh, you know, like uh, Dorothy going back to Kansas, the Technicolor goes to goes to black and white. The number of people who actually <laughs> watched, participated in this, um, you know, all the way through is, uh, well, probably about a handful. But um, they were great enthusiasts. <laughs> and that's who uh, people like me are dependent on. Um, here's another kind of experimental piece. And w one thing I'm interested in is, um, is, is doing certain experiments that are just my own, that, that, can on, that cannot be verified by anyone else. And, and this came out of a um, opposition to photography and this idea of photography uh, having some sort of claim to, to truth, uh, which, I'm, which I'm kind of skeptical of. So I, I, I did a series of work that was about things that could not be photographed. So I did a series about colors from my dreams. Uh, and, and this piece is called uh, Poke in the Eye. And so what I did was interested in, in, a, in a visual phenomenon that was caused by a non-visual stimulus. So I would poke m myself in the eye. And this, this happened like one boring evening in the studio. And, and these, shapes, these shapes appear. So um, this is. Uh, the outside edge, right eye, outside edge. So I was poking like this, and when I do it, still these same forms still appear. So that uh, first, the big blue shape comes in from the left with the, uh, with the yellow orange halo, and then the harder I push, the yellow shape comes in from the right. And it's, um, it's, uh, I don't know, it's like my own special little shapes that no one else knows about. So I don't know, we all need our little shapes. Um, something else that, uh, that I've been sort of looking at um, over, 
uh, well, over the last 20 years, is these sort of uh, mistakes that happen, so sort of uh, empirical mistakes. And um, so this is a very odd work that's called um, a, uh, lump of m a lump of concrete mistaken for a pile of dirty snow. And it, it is exactly that. I was walking down the street one day. It was about this time of year. There were snow piles on the street. I stopped. I looked down. There was this lump of snow. I looked back up. The light changed, so I had to wait. I looked back down. I realized it wasn't a lump of snow. It wasn't a pile of snow. It was a lump of concrete. And so I wanted to create something that could be two things at once, that could be both of those things. So depending on whether you looked at it out of the corner of your eye, whether you looked at it first or second, um, uh, it could be one of, one of those two things. And um, I spent a lot of time learning how to sort of cast these lumps. I mean, they look just like lumps, but they're, I mean, for me, <laughs> they're like, you know, wonderful sculptures. And, uh, and it was something that, um, I don't know, it, it, didn't, it, it didn't really have any legs, but it, uh, I, I really um, am incredibly fond of it. And, and somehow it was sort of important for me in terms of thinking about um, the sort of complexity of perception and, and, and visual experience. Um, and this is another kind of perceptual game that I, I play with myself when I'm driving on the highway. I'm, I'm pretty good at, uh, at recognizing types of cars. You know, I have been good at that since I've been a kid. So I, um, so as a car is coming up on, I'm a, also a slow driver, so often cars are passing me, I'm not passing them. So when they're passing on the left, I try to guess what kind of car it is and what color it is. And um, so this, I was on I-91 and I thought it was a, uh, I thought it was an Aqua Nissan, Nissan, but it in fact was a brown Chrysler. So, so I sort of did this in the sort of edge uh, it's just a pastel drawing of, of imagining it as this, uh, as this uh, aqua uh, Nissan. And, and our, um, our color perception in the periphery, of course, is not very good. And that's part of the reason, I guess, why I would get the color right. And, um, uh, and I guess also I, I couldn't see the, the d detail of the car so well. So, um, so when you're on the road and you need something to do, I recommend that to pass some time. Um, this is uh, another kind of perceptual piece. This is at the uh, Montclair Museum uh, in New Jersey. And they wanted a piece that would um, sort of soften this neoclassical facade a little bit. Uh, a lot of museums that were built about 100 years ago have these kind of facades. They're imposing. People don't like to come in them because they, 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 they look unfriendly. So I had this idea of uh, in these sort of niches that are sort of window-like to create uh, a sort of domestic uh, uh, yellow um, glow uh, that would make it feel more, more home-like. But what I wanted to do was to create yellow without using yellow. So, it, um, so it's a bit of an illusion. So it's, so it's, uh, it's RGB and it's uh, red and green with a tiny bit of blue. And, um, and so as you get close to the boxes, you realize that it's, the, it's uh, this stripe uh, pattern. And as you get further away, and that looks more yellow there than it is. It's all about calibration. Um, but, and then as you get back uh, further away, it sort of comes together. And if you look carefully, you see some sort of striations in there. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's more yellow. It was kind of impossible using this sort of, uh, this sort of pix pixelization that I was using to get a sort of subtle domestic yellow. And um, when I described it to a friend of mine, how I was trying to create this sort of domestic glow, and he said, he said, well, that didn't work. It sort of looks like a nuclear reactor in there. I don't think you're, gonna, I don't think you're going to entice very many people in. But, um, but, but they're happy with it, you know, in any case. At least they seem to be. Um, here's a, a, a project um, that I did that is about um, the sort of changing of, uh, or the sort of, sort of impossibility of, of, uh, of observing something carefully. It was done at, at Folkestone, which is in the English Channel, uh, a couple years ago. And um, so 
it was this uh, wheel and that was mounted on the uh, sort of overlook over the channel that spins and then you can align it with an aperture and uh, has a hundred different colors that were based on observations I did at different times from Folkestone of the sea there. And um, so you can spin the wheel and match it to the closest Pantone color. So it's a participatory piece and then also at uh, 12 o'clock each day an official from the town came and matched the color officially for that day and then went into the center of town and raised a flag that was the exact color of the, uh, of the English Channel on that day. And so, so that's that day and then the three previous days. And so people who were uh, you know, too, uh, or too tired or too uninterested in actually going to see the water, they could just walk into this park in town and see what color it was it was on that day. Um, part of, uh, I guess, science is using instruments. And I do, I, I, I really depend on direct observation mostly in my work. But I, there are some instruments I use. The one I use a lot is a colorimeter, a color light meter, for recreating specific light conditions of a place. Because I can't, I feel like I, I, my eyes are not trained enough to, un, to sort of uh, record light conditions. I know generally what it is, but in order to get it accurate. And, and uh, it's something I'm interested in is taking a landscape, the light of a landscape, and recreating it in another place. And so I do use uh, that instrument for that uh, reason. Um, one other instrument I use is uh, uh, thermometers. And these are, these are drawings that I do of the studio window at different times of day using false color, uh, false colors to record different temperature ranges. So I record the temperature I, uh, from the thermometers as the sun hits the windows at different times of day and then create these drawings. You can see the sort of scale there. Um, the nice thing about false uh, colors is that they, you can make them up. And so I can sort of indulge my, my love of color. You know, usually everything is sort of, is somewhat prescribed by uh, this sort of, these sort of conceptual constraints that I create for myself. But um, with false color, I really can say, you know, 81 to 85 degrees, it can really be any, any color. And then, um, and so it's an opportunity to use these fantastic Sennelier oil pastels and create these color combinations like that brown next to that pink, which for me is, is, is fantastic. So this is, um, uh, you know, it's sort of, uh, well, it's, I mean, it's a couple things. It's, it is, in a sense, it's sort of artistic indulgence. And, uh, but at the same time, this sort of idea of t taking something invisible, this sort of secret life of glass, and making it visible in, in, these, uh, in these drawings. There's one. Uh, this is like early in the morning. Here's a, um, here's a work that actually deals with this idea of different, uh, of different uh, color, uh, different colors of light at different times of day. This was installed in Berlin a few years ago. And what I did is I recorded the light in the gallery in the morning, recorded the color of uh, the light in the gallery in the uh, evening, and then and then shifted it. So if you put your head in the box on the right in the morning, you will experience the color of the light in the space at dusk. And if you put your head in the box on the left at night, in the evening, you'll experience the light of the space in, um, ah, how do I? So, and then when you step back, the, the piece sort of exists as a um, more of a, a description because you're in some sort of different light conditions, but you sort of see that, well, you, you think it, the place always looks the same, but it's, it's really so relative and that it can be so different as that. Um, I know that it's, it's sort of a weird, complicated piece. I wasn't very good at explaining it. Um, this is one of the molecule pieces uh, that, uh, that Larry was describing that's going up in Baltimore now. 
This is based on the molecular structure of, uh, of a pigment. So what I, it's called the night sky. And so I, I went out to the painted desert in Arizona and mixed pigment to match the, uh, the color of the, of the sky. And it was mostly, uh, mostly uh, black, a black pigment, iron oxide, which is Fe203. And then uh, some blue, a sort of complex ultramarine molecule, which you see at the top center. A little bit of titanium white, TiO2. And then there was, uh, I think there was some cobalt, um, cobalt, uh, yeah, cobalt blue, which would be cobalt aluminate. I think it's COAL2O3. But um, a, a, a sort of funny thing about th these was, um, I mean, I guess uh, it may not be too much of a surprise, but my, my father was a scientist. He was a chemist and, was, um, and uh, I was always sort of against, was kind of rebelling for a long time against everything he stood for. Um, and, uh, but it, it clearly had some sort of influence. And then, um, and then it became something that, that he was interested, I was interested in, and he, uh, he would help me on these, um, on these molecule pieces. So it was, it was a sort of weird bonding that we had. And I remember at the, uh, at the um, opening of, of one exhibition where I, um, where I had a molecule piece up, and it was, um, uh, it, my father was looking at it very carefully. He was involved in it and, and in figuring, figuring out the, the correct proportions of each molecule and so forth. And, uh, and he was looking very closely at one molecule and a friend of uh, mine went up to him and asked him, well, did he do it right? Did he get it right? And <laughs> my dad said, oh yeah, it's right, but I don't understand why there's this little blue piece of duct tape on the molecule. And, and it was because I had had to change one of the light bulbs and I hadn't removed and I hadn't removed the piece of duct tape. And so it was like really, for me that's in somehow it sort of encapsulated the difference between a sort of scientist and an artist and looking at that, at that particular art piece. He, he like really could not figure out what that piece of duct tape was doing on the, on the sculpture. Here's, um, Here's a project that has never really worked for me. I think that's maybe something uh, that we have in, in common, um, is sometimes you work on things that, that never really pan out, that you never quite figure out. And this was a, a, a project that I worked on with a, a scientist from Berlin who's an expert on insect vision. I was really interested in trying to see what bees see. And so he helped me sort of create an environment. They see a color called bee purple, which is a combination uh, of uh, between uh, purple and uh, between ultraviolet and blue, I think, uh, and um, it's something that that we can't see. And of course, they also have compound eyes. So we worked really hard trying to create an environment that is uh, that would somehow allow humans to get a sense of what it's like to be a bee and to see what a bee sees, and. Um, this was, I've, I've tried it two times, actually once at the RISD Museum, which was a slightly different iteration. And it, it's, um, it, it just isn't, you know, it's not, I mean, it's something that's impossible to do because we cannot see it that wavelength. We cannot see it. But, but this idea, this, this desire to sort of be able to see that, to be able to see what a bee sees is really compelling to me. So I'm trying, you know, I'll try it again, but, uh, and someday I'll get closer. But it's, uh, so it involves, um, in, in, it sort of involved like black light uh, paint, which you can see there, and then also filtering out a lot of the wavelengths of color from the uh, full spectrum fluorescent light. So you can see the, the filters on the lamps. So it was a, a sort of approach to it, but it, it didn't quite get there. Maybe it needs to be a sort of looser, yeah, a looser way of getting there. But um, this is, so this is sort of, I guess, an ongoing project that I think about now and then and try to figure out a way of, of making it work and be successful, not as a scientific experiment, but as an, an artwork. Um, and this, I, I'm, I have a sort of uh, interest in bees that comes really from, 
uh, Emily Dickinson, uh, probably from more than anywhere else. And for this, I did use an instrument. I used a, um, I, I, I used a, a GPS device to uh, follow a bee through a meadow, and, um, and that's the line that you see. And then the colors, the pastel is uh, our flowers, the colors of flowers that the bee stopped and pollinated. So um, this was one of those projects where I was uh, behaving you know, a little bit crazily with my GPS and then pushing a, putting a flag in at each point where a flower was, recording what the flower was, and then I went back and photographed it so that I could match it. And then this uh, recreates the path that the, um, that the bee took. Uh, here's, here's a work that I had, hadn't thought about in a long time, that, but that has to do with this idea of trying to understand, trying, I guess trying to see anything clearly, which is important really for an artist. And it's called, um, <laughs> it's a deeply philosophical piece. It's called uh, One Donut, Twelve Times, 12 donuts one time and one donut 12 times. And uh, this idea of trying to um, also in sort of, uh, in, in a sort of opposition to the totality of, of photography, the idea that you can sort of capture, uh, capture the completeness of anything in a single image, which to me is preposterous. And this idea, I mean, look at how different that donut could, can look. And, this, and now that I, I think about this, there was a brief moment in, um, in uh, sort of the history of astronomy, which was probably about 20 years ago, when um, ast uh, astronomers thought that the, uh, that the universe was shaped like a donut. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but it, and I, I don't think they think it's that case anymore. But so I was, I was sort of thinking about it. Now I remember, I was, it really was about the universe, like everything else. But uh, you know, now that the scientific theory has changed, it's just a donut. <laughs> it's not a metaphor for the universe anymore. So thanks for that. Um, um, here's, uh, here's one more piece that, um, that I did use an instrument for. And this is um, a piece that re recreates uh, um, the light of dawn on Mars. So one of the, it was the Voyager mission in the 70s that actually had, among the other instruments, a colorimeter on, um, on uh, board. And so they did measurements of the, the, uh, the color of the light using the CIE scale. And, um, and then I recreated that light using uh, filters and these uh, so-called full spectrum fluorescence. So um, this was a case where I didn't really, I, 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 I generally feel like I need to go and see something for myself. I don't trust you know, other people's reports. I don't trust instruments. But it, I wasn't really able to go to Mars. And so I, I used that NASA data to, to recreate that uh, experience of uh, sunrise on Mars. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the project here. Um, I mean, I hope that you will take time to look around when you can, especially to go into the bathrooms upstairs, um, where there, there are some pieces uh, sort of uh, hidden away. So this, in a weird way, was the inspiration. When I, when I was talking to, to, uh, to Larry about patterning, he had said one thing that engineers are always looking for is where a pattern is broken, where, where, the, where the pattern is, is uh, where the symmetry breaks where 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 the where the where the weakness is um, where where something can go wrong you know it's like where the where the disaster is and uh, and engineers are you know determined to stop that from happening and so they're looking for these these sort of gaps or errors or or, or weaknesses or inconsistencies or or breaks and um, so I thought about this the bathroom tile and the house I grew up in outside New Haven where there was this tile, so this tile that was always out of place on the bathroom floor. And so as I was thinking about this, I called my mom, who still lives there, and I said, because she's changed some things in the house over the years, I said, is the bathroom, <laughs> is the bathroom tile in that small bathroom still the same? She said, yes, and uh, is, it, um, 
I said, well, is that one tile still out of place? And I know, as a child, I never mentioned this to anybody. It just like drove me crazy, but it's not something you'd think anyone would want to talk about. And she said, yeah, yeah, it is. We never got that fixed. And so I said, would you, would you take a picture of it for me? And so that was the first slide for my presentation for the, for the art committee here. And um, I've since like, talked to my sister about it. And she said, oh, yes, that drives me crazy. I still can't go in that room. <laughs> and so that became, in, in a weird way, this sort of uh, impetus for, uh, for thinking about this project. And um, one thing that we, we had a lot of discussion about was whether there should be imperfections or errors built into the, uh, the tessellations that are included in, in the artwork here. And we ended up with just, uh, there's one. There's just one error. And I, I, don't, I wouldn't even say where it is. And it, it, the error was not included in the original fabrication because the installers realized it was an error. So they, they changed it to how it should be. But now we're going to change it back so that the error is there. So there's one in all of this uh, tessellation here um, in the building. So I, I, hope, I hope someday someone notices that and, and reports back. Or I hope it just drives them totally crazy, like this drove me crazy. Um, a lot of this, um, I was talking to students earlier today, and, and one thing that is, um, one thing that I really was afraid of with this project, which is a, a, a sort of ongoing, one, one of my many ongoing fears, is uh, this concern about, uh, in this environment, doing something that is sort of pseudo-engineering or pseudo-science, and something that would, that engineers would look at and say, oh, that's stupid. And so I really wanted to do, think about something that was, that would be engaging to engineering students and also engaging to art students. And um, I, um, as I started like learning about tessellation, learning about tiling, and got a lot of books about it, and I, I really thought that I could figure it out, you know, that I could like read this and like I could get it. And I, I tried and I, you know, it's, it's like heavy math. I couldn't get it. Um, so, but I've always been really interested in patterns that appear in, in architecture, that appear in art, and um, that, have, that exist in all kinds of, uh, all, different, all different cultures. Um, and then there are certain patterns that are so sort of, that are um, mathematical, but, um, but also, I think, uh, sort of easily comprehensible to the layperson. And this is one of my favorites, which I'm, I'm uh, still obsessed with, which is squared squares, which is the smallest number of squares of different sizes that can exist in, uh, in a single square. And I think this is the small, this is either the smallest or the second smallest. The smallest, I think, is 21. And it's just so, I find it so beautiful as a sort of, has a sort of demonstration of abstract thought. And it, of course, connects to all kinds of geometric painting. And uh, it is something that is, uh, that sort of exists in both worlds and can be appreciated for different reasons by different viewers, which is something that is really important for me. I, I, I feel like you don't need to be able to understand the underlying math to appreciate these sort of beautiful re related uh, tessellation patterns. And then I'm hoping people who do understand the math can sort of get something more out of it or you know, maybe it's, it's somehow uh, inspirational. Uh, there's, there's another one. And these are, I, I mean, these are, these are all related. I mean, I, I cannot understand exactly how these 18, so there are 18 patterns repeated three times. But they all are, they all are in the same family of tessellation, <coughs> which is, um, for me, so sort of wonderful. There's like this, I mean, it's almost like the, the like human family. It's like, oh, you know, they sort of look different, but like the DNA is exactly the same. And like this, you know, they're, they're all quite different. But these all share a, a sort of a commonality in, in, uh, in their sort of uh, mathematical description. And um, so, uh, yeah, and that's that. This is the one that's absolutely most uh, complex, which I really do not understand, which is Wang tiles. And um, I'm not even going to try to explain it, but it's a, you know, it's a complex tiling technique that sort of uh, builds out from a, 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 a single point. And, and develops in a, in a seemingly random way. And, and there are two of those uh, on this floor and then on the, on the lower level, two different, two different Wang tile arrangements. 
So um, that's, uh, that's it. That's all I got. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. Yeah. How did you get the GPS on the B? So I, uh, so I was no, so I was I was following around behind it. So I had the GPS, yeah. So I was following the B. Yeah, yeah. So I was chase, I was chasing it around. They actually move pretty slowly. They're, yeah, yeah. They're sort of, you know, sort of lolling around from flower to flower. So and then it was just and then that pattern is recorded in the GPS. And at each flower, I'd put a flag in that had a number. And then I had kept track of each number and which flower it was. And I went back to each flower then and, um, and took a photograph of it so I knew what the color was and then matched it against pastel. So that was my, yeah. Yeah. The one with the different size squares, uh -huh. is that actually a theorem? Is that distribution of both sides of the squares is the minimum number that you could have? I think. They, I mean, at this point, they think that is the minimum. But you know, it's uh, um, there's an entire website devoted to squared squares that is fantastic. That um, um, that I, I don't I don't fully understand. But they 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 now th they're pretty sure that the minimum is 21. But I, I guess it's I mean because for a while it was like 20, I mean it was 22, and then before that was 23, and that was 28. And uh, there's a whole there's a whole history of of squared squares as this sort of uh, particular subgenre of, of, of tessellation. That is, it's, it's really totally uh, fascinating about how it, how it has progressed. Yeah. How important do you consider your own engagement with your own job with the math behind these patterns, the math that generates these patterns? Um, I mean, to the, I mean, it, it's important that it's accurate. So, for example, that the, you know, that the, um, the Wang tiles, I don't understand it, and which is unusual for me. I mean, like normally, I, I feel like I can, uh, I, I, I can understand it. So, I, I wanted it to be accurate, but after I, I, I made a, 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 an attempt to try to understand it, I, I, and I felt I really didn't have the abilities, <laughs> or it would become a full-time job. Um, I sort of. Uh, was was determined that it be an accurate representation of it, so people who can understand it can uh, uh, be assured that it's right. But I mean, normally I'm not dealing with like you know really complex mathematics in my work. I mean, I can do you know like a, a, a simple model of a molecule. I, I, I can I can hand I can handle that. But that's sort of that's sort of the limits. <laughs> yeah. Why did it end up as nine pieces of the building? Did you choose the sites? Was there something about that number? Was it just organic? It, um, well, I mean, it was in, in flux for a while. There were a few, I mean, there were a number of issues that we were working with. Uh, I mean, the budget, for one thing. We wanted to sort of max it out, get as much as we could uh, with, with the budget that we had. And then we, um, so there were, were there 12 space? I mean, because we had the space outside and, um, there, and then there were going to be acoustic ceiling tiles, so there were there were there were additional ones, and um, part of it was a sort of uh, reduction for uh, for cost purposes, and and we kind of decided which ones were most important, and also spread throughout the building in a way that they revealed themselves slowly. So it had to do both with the um, the sort of the, the architecture and the um, and, and you know the cost and and the materials for the for the different materials. I wanted them all to be different types of tessellation as well, so that they were they were different they were different things. And I really wanted it to be a prime number, but we ended up with nine. <laughs> so nine is good too. You can't have a prime. Nine is excellent. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, and small T. I wonder for you, because you're offering something experiential for each and every person, yeah. do you feel that in giving this to the viewer, you do give them their own truth? And as an example, I would use the fact that you cited male and female different 
senses and perception of vision. Yeah. So here I am in this building. I'm looking at this Spencer Finch, but I am a female, so I can really see. <laughs> in other words, can you comment on the personality, the offering of that? I mean, I guess there are, um, I mean, I, I think that that uh, that I think different viewers have different experiences with 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 the work, and I, I think that that's um, I think that's fantastic. I'm, I'm not interested in, in really dictating that kind of experience, and I also don't believe in like this 19th century idea of the artist revealing some sort of mystical truth that is then. Uh, precisely decoded by the viewer. I, 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 don't, I don't believe in that. Are, at you the, at saying, are you saying this is as close as we can get? Oh, I, I don't know. That I don't know. I, don't, I mean, of course, I'm trying to get closer every time. And that's, that's really what my, my whole, I guess, life's work is, is just to look more closely and to look, and, you know, to look at it one more time and think and, and to understand it better and to move around it and look at it from a different perspective and try to understand it. And that is not saying, and I think my goal is not for me to say, you know, I've now understood this object, this world better, uh, 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 and so you should look at it the way I looked at it. I think it's uh, saying, you know, I'm looking at it this way, You maybe you take from this work that you will look at the world differently and more carefully and more deeply. And, and you know, the, there's so much sort of beauty and wonder in the world. And like looking at things is so fantastic. Looking at all kinds of things is, is fantastic. And I mean, looking at, I, mean, I, can look at that for so, I can look at that for hours and it's just so wonderful. And I, I guess that, that idea of the sort of pleasure of looking and the complexity of looking and the humanness of looking is, is what I'm trying to convey. Yeah. Yeah. So I have two questions. Yeah. Much of your work focuses on color and light. So could you comment on sort of the different pieces and how color and light sort of influence the pieces? And the second question is, how did you come with the title, The Garden of the Brain? OK. I'll, I'll answer the first question in uh, first in that uh, the title, like many of my titles, uh, comes from uh, Emily Dickinson, who I'm a, I'm a, a, gr a groupie. <coughs> I spent a lot of time at her house in Amherst. At first, they wouldn't let me in, and now uh, I, <laughs> because a lot of crazy people like me show up there. Um, and I had a, a friend who was a curator who, who knew someone at Amherst, so finally I got in, and I've done a number of things there, and I love going there, and I'm kind of, uh, I, I mean, I'm like a crazy Emily Dickinson groupie, and I get a lot of titles from, from, from her. And, uh, and she's a great source for that. And the, the, what I was thinking about with the garden, uh, the garden in the brain was this idea of um, kind of abstract thought and what's happening, you know, this idea of the students here. And, you know, they're like, you know, they're like at the sort of prime of their sort of, uh, you know, intellectual ability, you know, and they've got all these like neurons firing and there's all this sort of abstract uh, thought happening and all of this, incredible deep thinking that's happening in their brain and and that I thinking of that as this sort of garden this sort of this sort of wild garden of like blooms and colors and everything it just seemed connected to that and and that being a link to the abstraction of the tessellation the relationship between sort of um, mathematics and and the natural world and so what the brain and and, and the universe and um, in, t in terms of your question of light and color um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in both of those things. I wasn't always. Um, it's something that I've, I've sort of like come to. Uh, and, um, and I feel like I'm not like a natural colorist, but I, I, I love thinking about color. I love the sort of philosophical implications of color, especially. And with light, I especially like the idea of light in relationship to landscape. And I, I'm, I, I love landscape, especially in a in a um, 19th century sense, uh, both like Hudson River painting and Impressionist painting. I'm not interested in doing that kind of painting. I'm not interested in those conventions of painting, but I am interested in light and landscape and thinking about how uh, landscape can be understood through light. Yeah. 
talked about Emily Dickinson. Who has the same effect on you as a visual artist? Um, I mean, you know, there are there are a lot of um, there are, uh, a lot of great artists. I mean, one show I'm thinking that I've been thinking about a lot recently was this uh, show of Ad Reinhardt's blue paintings um, that were up at um, David's Werner in the fall. And um, when I was first in New York, I had a job working in publishing in Midtown. I would go to um, MoMA at lunchtime, and I looked a lot at those. Um, Reinhardt paintings, and there were, uh, there were a couple black ones and a blue one, and I would spend a lot of time looking at them. And that, and sort of before that time, I was doing work that was really not very visual, that was very sort of conceptual and dry, and and that, and looking at those and seeing how those works revealed themselves over time, and how this sort of, how they they really sort of exist in time, and Lucy Lepard wrote a great essay about that, about the sort of, uh, how they're diachronic in a way, and, and so that was really, I, 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 that sort of sent me on my way thinking about, oh, well, I should try to make things that can be, you know, conceptually interesting and visually engaging. So, I mean, that's one person who uh, was really inspiring, and then going back and seeing all these paintings, many of which I had not seen in the, in the fall, was great, and also you can't see them in reproduction, and I love that, that you cannot, you just cannot experience it in reproduction, you have to be there, and I, I think that's a wonderful thing about visual art, that you have to be there. Thank you, Spencer. I'm gonna stop here. Oh. Would you suggest we all have a drink if you have time, and I know there are some folks who are running off to another event, but thank you very much. Thanks for coming.